Financial Institute. Fancy a bit of um, bit of Aussie action. Let's go down under, shall we? Melbourne Cup as we continue and indeed conclude our Grand Slam tour of the universe. Uh, we're headed down to the Melbourne Cup, the race that stops the nation, as I'm pretty much obliged to say because we have to include all the cliches. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful prize, of course, hugely competitive, hugely valuable time form. When we had a look at the top races around the world, it was a little bit further down the races, I suppose, because it is a handicap, Jamie, and, and therefore you're going to get some lower rated horses hitting the money. That's right, yeah. It's, it's a tricky one to work out because even more so than the Breeders' Cup, uh, as James was saying, the biggest trials are still to come, the Caulfield Cup, the Cox Plate. So w what this is, it's a representation of, um, obviously, each horse has been given a set weight, so we've got the weight they have to carry and then the time form rating next to them. It mm. just gives you some idea of the relationship between these horses judged through Australian eyes compared to what we time know from our and So again, these are adjusted time form ratings taking into account? Sorry, these are the, their official time form ratings, so you can see what each horse has got to carry. So, for example, yeah. Mount Athos... 54, that's about 54 kilos he has yep. to carry. It's around about three pound is about one and a half kilos. So in effect, he's getting nine pound off Dunarden. He's getting two pound off Brown Panther and Joshua Tree, getting one pound off Arzima and Dandino. So again, it seems odd to say, but again, he's the horse in time form terms who we think has been underestimated mm. by the Australian handicapper. Now, obviously, last year, what happened to him? Unlucky. How unlucky? Uh, it's a question mark of whether he actually won the race or not, but certainly should have and could have finished closer than fifth. Mm. So the Australians think that he's the same horse again this time around. I can't we, remember what the handicapper did to him. Is he on the same mark? He's as on the last same. Year? Exactly, exactly the same. Exactly mark, the same. Yeah. Um, I think Fiorente is on the same mark as well, isn't he? Just two pound higher. Two pounds higher. Just two pounds higher. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So there's. Yeah, in that respect. That's right, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah Fiorenti is actually quite well in. Compared yeah. to the winners, actually £10 higher, Green yeah. Moon. So Fiorenti looks well in. But nothing really went ideally for Mount Athos. Yeah, this yeah. is last year's renewal, yeah. we should point out. And Green Moon is going to win it. Fiorenti is going to run second. Jack will be for Marco Botti, third. And uh, Mount Athos in fifth. I tell you what, let's cross across and, and, and get get the commentary on this because as, um, as Jamie says it's, it's, a, it's a, an eye-catching run in particular from Mount Athos who eventually runs on into fifth. You've got Red, Red Caddo back in eighth but here's the call on last year's Melbourne Cup. Precedence and then Jingle Berry two lengths to nine with Tech Nebraska on Mount Athos who's starting to stride around the field. The lucky day, Red Cado, and they're followed by Cavalryman. Duna Den has gone right back, he's third from last, and behind him is Winchester, unusual suspect, and the billionaire is back at the tail of the field. So Glenn Cannon Gold has the lead in the Melbourne Cup. Out to the riverside, two and a half lengths on Lights of Heaven. Kalini is running third, and Ethiopia is holding down fourth. One further back as Murian gets a good run from Galileo's choice. A length further back is Green Moon. Then Fiorente, my quest for peace in Sanagas. One to the grey to Voila Isi, American next on the inside. Being followed by Precedence and Jackalberry as they race up the side. Mount Athos next on the outside. Behind these, Nywood as they go past the halfway mark. Tacta Wastron improving on his outside. They're being followed. Red Cado, Malucky Day, Duna Den, Cavalryman well back with unusual suspect. Winchester second last. The billionaire still brings up the rear. So Glenn Cadam Gold, 1300 to go, a length and a half clear. Lights of Heaven running second. Kaleni is third. Ethiopia is fourth. And then came Murian. Galileo's choice enjoying a good run. One to Green Moon. They're followed further back by Fiorente. Behind these, Mike Quest for Peace. Sanagas is being wide. Voila Easy. Mad Athos. American nowhere to go from precedence. And then came Tacta Rustron. Jackalberry. Well back as Nywood and Red Cado. The lucky day. Duna Day still giving them a long start coming down the side and he's being followed then by uh, unusual suspect cavalry man's a billionaire Winchester's back at the tail 800 left to go in the cup and the lucky day the leader or rather Glen Cannon Gold the leader a length and a half in front of lights of heaven running second from Kalenny they're being followed Fiorente uh, creeping into it Galileo's choice on the outside from Sanagas Voila Isi back behind those horses my quest for peace who's over on the fence now they corner an American can has made his way to the outside and Duna Den's a fair way back then Cannon Gold had the lead, here's Murian after him and Green Moon is coming on Kalini's joining in in the middle too they were clear then from Fiorente starting to work home and then came Jackalberry then Cannon Gold is grabbed by Green Moon Green Moon dashed to the lead of the Melbourne Cup followed by Kalini, Fiorente starting to come home, Green Moon out in front for Brett Preble, he's two lengths clear from Fiorente and Green Moon wins the Melbourne
incidents my quest for peace cavalry men america and didn't come on so that was the running of last year's Melbourne Cup down in Australia. Green Moon coming out on top there for uh, jockey Brett Preble. Fiorente running second, uh, just uh, gone up, I think, a kilo or so uh, with the Aussie handicapper. Is in good form, though. He's, he's, he's won his last couple down in Australia. You, you'll probably guess from my comments that I, I quite like Fiorente's uh, chances. Jackal Brief, uh, Marco Botti was third. Uh, Collini was fourth. Mount Athos was in fifth. And you may have seen him with Red Caddo. Both made their challenge wide. Both got uh, forced a little bit wide coming into the straight. What else do we have? American was 11th. Uh, cavalry man in 12th. Dunedin only 14th in the end, the uh, winner from the previous year who sent off favourite. They do get hammered in the waist, don't they, previous winners, as yeah. we've seen with with, um, with Green Moon. And poor old um, Dunedin, I think, has still got a, a hefty yeah. task, hasn't he, compared to when he won it. Um, what about how that race panned out tactically? Because as, as we switched to commentary, you, you were saying there, James, they, did, they weren't going very quick at that point. No, they weren't going quick. And, and as it turned out, if you weren't in the first five, turning into the straight, you weren't going to be in the first three uh, at the winning post. Um, and and uh, of the horses coming from off the pace, Mount Athos did comfortably the best, despite on a couple of occasions not having the clearest of runs and having to switch. So ran a storming race, but the, the way the race was run definitely favoured horses that were on or mm. near the pace. Mm. Mm. We, you reeled off the names there of the horses who were close up. The first eight were all either European trained or started their careers in Europe. Yes, yes. And actually, all bar one of the first 12 were, had European background or were still trained over here. So there's, there's been a preoccupation in Australia with breeding speed, and obviously they did it to maximum effect with the mighty Black Caviar. They actually cracked that. But while they were working in this particular lab, the staying horses weren't being bred that way. And that's why there's so much um, of a willingness to come and try and get some European blood into their pedigrees and start, start looking at that way because it is the most important race in the whole of Australia and they were in danger of taking their eye off the ball, so to speak, with that. Monson, incidentally, our favourite sire of the moment, say, yeah. Fiorenti, the sire of Fiorenti, yeah. the first runner down there. Yeah. And that's exactly the sort of blood that they want, the, the stamina getting better with age, maturing blood, that's what they need now. So just interesting little side angle Just there. on Mount Athos, while we were watching that, I just quickly went back to Ryan Moore's Betfair piece that he wrote, because it was a piece about race riding in the Racing Post, and, and, and one of the rides that was mentioned was Mount Athos. And, and this, is, this is what he had to say, because mm. we're guilty, all of us, of saying he was unlucky, uh, because he's finishing fast. Um, and he says, look, I'll, I'll let you into a secret here. I've broken down the Melbourne Cup. This is Ryan Moore in his Betfair column. You can, you can look it up online. Um, I've broken down the Melbourne Cup many times, even to the point of getting the sectionals for my horse and others. And I can tell you now, I wouldn't change a great deal. I simply couldn't have done a lot different the way the race panned out. Now, he's not saying I w yeah. uh, the race went perfect, because it didn't. He says, well, uh, but initially pulling up after the race, he was gutted and thought he'd been desperately unlucky. But when he's gone back through it, he's, he said, you know, the horse was slowly into his stride. He met trouble, and that wasn't good news, never a good news in a, in a slowly run race in a big big field, the horse can take a grip and he's not the easiest horse to settle. So, I think there's a note of caution in what Ryan's saying there, that don't assume mm. that he'd have won with a, a no. clear run. But, but and the, the other, other thing hand, is it's, it's happened to him before, so yeah. why won't it happen again? Yeah. It's how the race impacted Mount Athos rather than yeah, how yeah. Mount Athos and the ride impacted on the race, isn't it? He was a hostage to fortune and the circumstance to some extent there. Mm. But obviously since then and quite recently we've had the more public criticism mm. of Jamie Spencer by uh, Luca Comani to yeah. do with Mount Athos's rides. Yeah. He's come in for in Britain yeah. this year and he yeah. said that he's going to try and employ an Australian jockey. When Luca Comani has gone close and very close to winning the Melbourne Cup previously yeah. he's had talking a about the Japanese going for Australian the Australian Absolutely. No, it, it, it must be an Melbourne obsession Cup. with him. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But he's the right horse to win a Melbourne Cup. He's that blend of speed and stamina that ideally, it's, it's a bit of a cliche, but you do need. So interesting that he is going to go for an Australian jockey this time around. And he's I been think. given a chance by the Aussie handicapper, mm. and on time form ratings, he must come out top, does he? Yeah, he was top rated last year, and that includes the Australian horses who we have got, again, a, a, a team down in Australia who crunched the numbers, and he was top rated overall. 
with the newcomers in the Australian scene, there are more homebred horses who are now coming through that we might touch upon. Yeah, yeah. I'm not exactly sure whether we'll be top rated, but I would say that he's got the best form chance of the Europeans again, given the way he has to carry. Okay, yeah, Fiorente, we should mention. A lot of people might think Fiorente is a, a, a British horse because it was with Sir Michael Stout, but of course now a game waterhouse. But go on. Jeff. Well, I was just going to underline the point that Jamie made earlier, which and, and he was saying that uh, that there are some uh, Australian young homebreds coming through. There's not many, no. you know, and there's, there's kind of an unwritten rule at the moment, which is if it's a mile or, sh well, if it's shorter than a mile, the Aussies are going to be better than us, yeah. as they prove with Black Caviar and Takeover Target and Choisir and all, the, all of those. And if it's further than a mile, we're going to be better than them, which is quite a big advantage to have. The only problem with that is they pinch a lot of, the, I mean, they pay decent money for them. They pinch a lot of our decent mile and a quarter, mile and a half and upwards horses yeah. off us if, uh, in the sales anyway. So, so a lot will be flying the Australian flag, even though they've spent a lot of their careers in Europe. The world has literally turned upside down in <laughs> racing terms. The sprinters... Yeah. Uh, come up here and the stairs go down there. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll talk about some of the, the homegrown uh, talent as yeah. well as some of the imported talent in a bit more detail in a moment. But right now, let's get another word with Enzo. Thank you, Sean. You've got an email about the Melbourne Cup that I thought was quite interesting. It's from uh, Hussain. He actually mentions a horse that I quite fancy at, at a bigger price outside the, less, the, the more obvious ones. I want to ask James about her chances as well in a moment. But first of all, he says, uh, first pick is Mount Athos, the horse we've touched on. This is with Luca looking to book a local jockey on board, plus the unlucky defeat last year. He looks sure to go close. I think we've covered that. Uh, Mount Athos looks the right type. Um, a great plus is he has the same weight as last year. The second pick, this is the horse I was looking at, Verima, is a filly trained in France. So says, unlucky defeat in Maidan, coming back from a long layoff, so travelling and running fresh is no problem, um, but number 40 in the weights, so needs 16 to come out before she gets in, Verima. Plus the French have taken the race twice in the last three years, of course, with Dunad and, and Americaine as well. These two are excellent value, considering that Puissance de Lune in particular is even more vulnerable at the distance than So You Think was. Of course, Puissance de Lune, better form at shorter than the Melbourne Cup. It's a good point that Hussein makes, but um, I'm going to get James's thoughts on Verima in a moment, because I know it's a horse that um, must have seen racing in uh, France. What about the draw? Is it the be all and end all? In the Melbourne Cup, many people think you can't win from a high draw. Well, shocking proved that you could uh, when he won it four years ago out of uh, gate 22. But in recent years, you can see Green Moon won it out of five uh, last year. The year before that was Dunadan from stall 13. Americane won from stall 11. Shocking from gate 22. Uh, going back, Viewed won from stall 8. Efficient from stall 9. Uh, Delta Blues from stall 10. The great Maccabi Diva, she won it wherever she was, 14, 7 and 14. Um, that, that, that's the draw. I mean, generally, if we take out the shocking draw, um, stall 22, it's generally been a middle-ish kind of draw, isn't it, that's done best in the Melbourne Cup. What about that stat at the bottom there? Six-year-olds um, have won the last three runnings, Green Moon, Dunad and Americane, and also eight of the last 15, which I thought was quite a high percentage there as well, have gone to a six-year-old. So that's the sort of age group you're looking for there. But I do want to ask James Crisp about Verima. James, have we found one? 25 to 1 if she gets in for the Melbourne Cup? Well, first of all, I'd like to put your mind completely at rest about her getting in. Because although she's 40 in the weights, it's a bit complicated in that in order to qualify for a run, the ho every horse has to have uh, either won or been placed in a, a staying race over a mile and a half or further uh, at a certain level. Either, yeah. either won a listed race, been placed in a Group 3 or been in the first five in a Group 1. Verima makes that qualification and a lot of the others don't and there's not that much time for it to happen so I've got the the balloting list in front of me and Verima is currently 21st with a field of 24. Um, now no, she's not absolutely guaranteed a run why you ask well the reason is some can leapfrog over her because some are higher than her in the weights can then qualify by getting placed in in the in the long distance races and a further complication is there are a few races on the Australian calendar that are win and you're in races so it doesn't matter where you are in the weights you can be very low down the weights if you win one of these races these trial races you you, you will run yep. a, above a horse that uh, uh, in preference to a horse who's meant to carry more weight than you so I think I've muddied the waters there but all I can tell you is Verima is virtually certain to get a run so that's good yeah I think that sounds good I just the only thing I wonder about I mean uh, one thing that I, I, I definitely want to say when we're talking about Australia is we shouldn't I know for the purposes of this program we're really talking about the Grand Slam but there are two massive races that uh, Jamie's already talked about, uh, which are the, uh, the Cox Plate and the Caulfield Cup. We will have runners in both, 
and and they they are fantastic races in their own right. They're worth three million, roughly three yeah. million Aussie dollars. The um, Melbourne Cup is worth six million. Horses like Forgotten Voice, Simonon, uh, that they're, they're already in quarantine. Sidehill Stud in Newmarket. Simonon's in Newmarket as we speak, and he's going out there for the Caulfield Cup. Um, whether uh, I think Simonon and Verima to an extent are the right horses to win the Melbourne Cup is another thing because I wonder whether they've got too much stamina. You don't really want, it may be a two mile race, but you don't really want a traditional, you know, your, your, the Persian punches of this world have gone over there and run very well, but they just haven't had that edge in speed. And if you look at a horse like Maccabee Diva, who won it three times an hour, right, maybe it's unfair, she's a bit of a freak. Let's Elope is another good example. I think it was either her second or third start before winning uh, the Melbourne Cup, she broke a course record over seven furlongs. So, you know, you need a lot of speed. Yeah. And to me, I wish Simon on nothing but the best. And I think Willie Mullins is one of my all-time heroes and, and it went further up in my estimation by cracking the Nakayama Grand Jump uh, jackpot earlier on this season, <laughs> which I always thought was an intriguingly valuable race that Europeans could target, and he did it. But I'm not sure that Simonon is the right kind of horse for this race. We will see. We'll talk about Simonon and one or two others as well right after the break.